Counting to God, Part 10. We've been discussing the book Counting to God by Douglas L. Um, it is available online. It is also available in hard copy if you want it. Um, the former, of course, is free. Um, and uh, there's the cover. Um, we've been discussing part two, the science of belief, and we have come to chapter 11, puzzles of macroevolution. Um, the beginnings uh, ask the question, how did life get so complex? And uh, the first part of the chapter, the stuff you see in yellow is mine, not his, uh, discussed the lack of transitional forms in the fossil record the sudden nature of changes in the fossil record, and the lack of a plausible mechanism for evolution. We've now come to the second part of the chapter, and he's going to talk about junk DNA. With a question mark behind it, because as we get done, we will see that the evidence for junk DNA is pretty slim. Let's go back to our analogy of mutations as changes to the letters and spaces in a paragraph. It's a fair analogy. Proteins are built out of sequences of 20 different amino acids. Text is built out of sequences, at least English text, of 26 letters and spaces and punctuation. A typical paragraph might have 300 to 400 letters, spaces, punctuation marks. A typical protein of a relatively simple organism might have 300 to 400 amino acids linked together. Just as a paragraph is a specified sequence of letters, spaces, and punctuation, a functional protein is a specified sequence of amino acids. The sequence also has to be folded correctly, and other information has to exist to produce that protein at the right time and in the right amounts. But we will ignore those bits of complexity here. Neo-Darwinian theory claims that accidental, random, bump-in-the-night mutations in DNA coding change the amino acid sequence and continually create new, useful new proteins. So their theory, and believe me, I am not making this up either, reference to Dave Barry, um, is that you sort of shuffle small pieces of the DNA you mix it up haphaz in haphazard, unorganized ways, and out pops the information to build a new functional protein. And this happens over and over again, billions of times in the history of life to produce all the amazing species on Earth. And this does not happen just one at a time, but sometimes when you shuffle, you get multiple new useful proteins that interact with each other just perfectly to create wholly new biological systems and body parts. As we've seen, that theory is mathematically ridiculous. The monkeys aren't likely to slice and dice Cervantes into James Joyce or Shakespeare into Tolstoy. But forget about the odds for now. If what they claim is true, then clearly most of the time during this slicing and dicing, during these accidental mutations of DNA, it doesn't work out very well. Most of the time, actually far more than 99.99% .99 of the time, what you get is a piece of junk a section of random, useless junk DNA. If neo-Darwinian theory is true, then as DNA is accidentally changed, we would expect to find interspersed among various intact genes, intact sections of DNA that are the code to build a functioning protein, and transform genes, new coherent sections of DNA that build the new functional protein, a lot of random, useless coding, a huge amount of junk DNA. That is exactly what diehard Darwinists first claimed. When early experiments revealed that less than 2% of human DNA codes for proteins, the remainder was quickly but falsely labeled junk DNA. A 2003 article in Scientific American calls this assumption too hasty and one of the biggest mistakes in molecular biology. The article added, the extent of this unseen genome is not yet clear, but at least two layers of information exist outside the traditionally recognized genes. One layer is woven throughout the vast non-coding sequences of DNA that interrupt and separate genes. 
Though long ago written off as irrelevant because they yield no proteins, many of these sections have been preserved mostly intact through millions of years of evolution. That suggests that they do something indispensable. And indeed, a large number are transcribed into varieties of RNA that perform a much wider range of functions than biologists had imagined possible. Some scientists now suspect that much of what makes one person and one species different from the next are variations in the gems hidden within our junk DNA. A 2006 article in Nature magazine reported that scientists are using code-breaking methods to analyze DNA's layers of information. Researchers now know that there are numerous other layers of biological information in DNA interspersed between or superimposed on the passages written in the triplet code. Human DNA contains tissue-specific information that instructs brains or muscle cells to produce the suite of proteins that makes them brain or muscle cells. Other signals in the sequence help decide at what points DNA should coil around its scaffold or structural proteins. By the way, the ellipses there are his. Many stretches of DNA in humans and other organisms manage to multitask. A sequence can code for a protein and still manage to guide the position of a nucleosome. The junk DNA myth took a perhaps fatal hit in September 2012. 450 scientists worldwide working on the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, or ENCODE as it's been abbreviated, project to map project, the ENCODE project to map the DNA human genome, simultaneously released 30 major papers. The lead paper in Nature noted that they were able to, quote, assign biochemical functions for 80% of the genome, in particular outside of the well-studied protein coding regions. You may remember that we discussed that at one point. It's likely, to, it's likely that 80% will go to 100%, stated one of the project's lead researchers. We don't really have any large chunks of redundant DNA. The metaphor of junk isn't that useful. The front page of the New York Times, now there's peer review if you ever saw it, um, announced the human genome is packed with at least 4 million gene sw switches that revise, uh, reside in bits of DNA that once were dismissed as junk, but that turn out to play cru critical roles in controlling how cells, organs, and other tissues behave. Now back to 1998, when the myth of junk DNA ruled and by the way, the more careful uh, uh, proponents of junk DNA would say that 10% of the genome was useful and the other 90% was junk. They recognized that 2% was not enough uh, and that some, there were some functions that non-coding DNA would have. But... Um, some say that intelligent design doesn't make predictions, but it does. It predicts that scientists will continue to find design in biological systems. In 1998, Bill Dembski predicted the demise of junk DNA. Consider the term junk DNA. Implicit in this term is the view that because the genome of an organism has been cobbled together through a long, undirected evolutionary process, the genome is a patchwork of which only limited portions are essential to the organism. Thus, on an evolutionary view, we expect a lot of useless DNA. And the best people would say 90%. The most theologically motivated people would say 97 to 98%. Um, thus, on an evolutionary view, we expect a lot of useless DNA. If, on the other hand, organisms are designed, we expect DNA as much as possible to exhibit function. Now, there could be decay, I suppose, so that I don't expect to find 100% um, DNA function, but 99% um, would not be unreasonable. ENCODE has validated design, and it is a huge problem for Darwinists. Some attempt to dance around it. As late as 2009, Darwinist Richard Dawkins wrote, this is in print. It is a remarkable fact that the greater part, 
95% in the case of humans. Notice Dawkins shades towards the theologically motivated side there. 95% uh, of the genome might as well not be there for all the difference it makes. Three years later, just six days after the ENCODE results were released, and this is on tape, I looked at it, in a public about face worthy of a master politician, he stated that the ENCODE results were, quote, exactly what a Darwinist would predict, end quote. Well, maybe some Darwinists, certainly not him. Exactly what a Darwinist would predict? Why? If Dawkins now means to suggest that small amounts of extra DNA confer a major evolutionary disadvantage, he is clearly wrong. While we humans have 3.2 billion letters of DNA, the marbled lungfish has 132 billion, and a rare Japanese flower, Paris japonica, has 152 billion. This reminds me of uh, what is sometimes called the onion test which is to say, why does the onion take 100 times as much DNA to code for onions than humans do to code for humans? And the implication usually is drawn that there must be a lot of junk DNA there, that it can't all be functional. Um, but the point that I think uh, Doug L is making, and correctly so, is that it, if that's the case, it can't be that deleterious either or the onion wouldn't have collected that much. There is no scientific evidence that extra DNA is an evolutionary disadvantage. Certainly not a significant enough one to be selected for or against. To me, ENCODE marks an important turning point in the ultimate de de demise of neo-Darwinism, although it may take years or even decades for our culture to appreciate its significance. You don't have to be a genius to see that if all or almost all our DNA serves a purpose. The theory that we arose simply from accidental mutations is utter nonsense. Also, the major defense against uh, the theory of genetic entropy falls apart. For this reason, many Darwinists ignore or deny the ENCODE results. If ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong, admits one, using evolution here to refer to neo-Darwinian neo theory. In case you're wondering, that's Dan Grauer, and he has a number of things on the internet that you can find uh, that explain exactly why he is dead set against ENCODE, and he's mad that they put 32 papers out at once because now he can't shoot them down one by one. He has to shoot all 32 of them down, and that's not going to happen easily. But ENCODE is not some fringe group. It is an international collaboration of 450 of the world's most respected scientists working together with no religious agenda whatsoever to build a comprehensive parts lift list of functional elements in the human genome. The ENCODE results make common sense. Anyone who has ever assembled a difficult item and spread parts across a garage or family room floor knows that it takes much more than the parts themselves to do the job. You need a lot of information on how and in what order to put the parts together. Now consider something almost unimaginably complex, such as our human bodies. In 300 trillion specialized yet interconnected cells, it takes a huge amount of information to put it all together and turn the systems in our body on and off when necessary. Let's talk liver. I'm going to omit some of the stuff he says, but in January 2013, scientists discovered that more than 3,000 epigenetic switches control liver functions, and there's a reference for that. These 3,000 epigenetic switches are exactly what, until recently, was considered junk DNA. They are part of at least 4 million gene switches discovered by ENCODE. 4 million gene switch, uh, switches. I think the efficient coding of GNA in multiple layers of information reveals design. Something is going on, something grander than haphazard mutations in natural selection. That something is scientific evidence for the existence of God. We saw in chapter 10 that of all the possible sequences of 150 linked amino acids, only one in 10 to the 77th can be expected to form a protein that can perform a specified function. 
Many of the animals of the Cambrian explosion needed the complex protein lysyl oxidase to support their bodies. That protein is made up of over 400 precisely sequenced, non-repeating, amino acids. There has been zero serious scientific rebuttal to Doug Axe's 1 in 10 to the 77th estimate in 2004. An earlier 1990 paper by two MIT biologists who are not intelligent design activist, uh, activists um, estimated the odds of getting a sequence of 92 amino acids, a shorter one than Doug Axe's, to perform a particular function as 1 in 10 to the 63. That's fantastically small. As we saw in chapter 8, a ball of marbles one half inch in diameter extending out in all directions 50 light years from Earth, 600 trillion miles. That would swallow up the star Sirius, among other things. Um, <clears throat> 600 trillion miles in diameter has about 10 to the 60 marbles. We haven't even got to the 10 to the 63, let alone to the 10 to the 77th. Moving on, irreducible complexity. As I read the literature challenging neo-Darwinian theory, I came across the concept of irreducible complexity. The basic idea is that some systems are put together so that if you take away any of the parts, the system won't work. Classic example is a mousetrap. You take away any of the platform, the spring, the hammer, the holding bar, or the catch, the rest of the pieces are totally useless. So the mousetrap is said to be irreducibly complex. At least they're useless in catching a mouse. As I mentioned in the introduction to this chapter, Charles Darwin recognized that an irreducibly complex biological system could not be produced by natural selection. And there's the quote at the beginning of the chapter, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. And the example that he gives is the eye. He thinks that it can be done by numerous successive slight modifications. Um, but Agel pulls us to the present and says, so we ask, are there biological systems that are irreducibly complex? Advocates of design believe many biological systems have this quality. Here are two. One, the bacterial flagellum. A molecular pro propeller that bacteria such as E. coli use to move. The bacterial flagellum resembles a rotary engine with up to 10,000 RPM. It has a variety of parts. The information to build these parts is typically coded by 30 to 40 genes. Some of these b uh, build the flagellum, uh, aren't just part of the flagellum itself, but uh, stages in building it. It has been proven that if you take away any of these genes, the flagellum does not work. In January two th 2013, scientists discovered a species of bacteria with spectacularly complex flagella. Seven coordinated motors in a hexagonal array separated by gear wheels. Bill Dembski told me the flagellum is the poster child of intelligent design. Blood clotting. Blood clots inside the body can be deadly. Uncontrolled bleeding is also fatal. When the skin is cut, a cascade of events involving over two dozen factors takes place to seal the wound. Blood clotting works pretty much the same for all mammals. It is highly conserved throughout biology. To me, these systems look irreducibly complex. Many scientists disagree and suggest ways some parts of these systems could have been formed by accident. The neo-Darwinian response is that all of the necessary parts arose in different systems where they played a useful role. It's a genuine debate, and part of the problem is that we don't know all of the logical pathways to creating and assembling biological parts. But even if some or all of the parts could have arisen elsewhere, you still need a tremendous amount of information to put the parts together. And they have to be prefabbed in order to do that, or else you have to mutate them to get them to fit as well. Mouse doesn't, mousetrap doesn't work unless the parts are put together just right. To me, these systems appear to be irreducibly complex. 
to me, that is scientific evidence of design. There are many amazing biological systems. Some are noted in Billions of Missing Links, a pro-design book by Jeffrey Simmons. One of his favorite systems is the attack spray of the African bombardier beetle. It carries separate storage tanks of hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone. Each is a relatively harmless chemical, but when mixed and a special catalyst added, they create a toxic stream. The bombardier beetle has both liquids plus the catalyst plus machinery to combine, aim, and fire this toxic stream at will. It can fire 500 bursts per second, each burst with a velocity of 65 feet per second. Recent evidence of design and the wonder of life comes from the loggerhead turtle. Adult loggerhead turtles are typically about a yard in length and they are found in most temperate parts of the world. Some Pacific loggerhead turtles make the longest migration of any aquatic creature. Their eggs are hatched in Japan and they traverse the entire Pacific Ocean. 6,000 miles to California and then return to Japan to lay their eggs on the same beach where they were hatched. How can they navigate so precisely across the Pacific Ocean and back? In 2012, scientists announced that loggerhead turtles navigate by Earth's magnetic field. They detect and use both the direction and the intensity of Earth's magnetic field to complete spectacular migrations, 12,000 miles for Pacific loggerhead turtles, 8,000 miles for Atlantic loggerhead turtles to the beach where they were born. When I commented in an online scientific discussion group that this was amazing, I got this response from physicist Rob Sheldon. It's more amazing than perhaps you realize. The Earth's magnetic field is approximately an offset dipole or a bar magnet that is placed near the center of the Earth but a tad closer to China. The direction of a dipole field tells you latitude because the field is vertical at the poles and horizontal at the equator. But the longitude, as this article explains, is harder to determine. The fact that it's closer to China causes the field over Brazil, or the so-called South Atlantic anomaly, to be a bit weaker. So if one knows the direction of the field and its magnitude, one can fit it to the model to find one's latitude and longitude. Measuring the mag magnitude of the magnetic field is tricky, and magnetometers have been employed only since the beginning of the 20th century. For one thing, the magnetic field is highly variable, with daily changes caused by ionosphere and random changes caused by aurora. Many subspeci my subspecialty of magnetic spheric physics has perhaps 20 to 50 people who do nothing but generate magnetic indices that attempt to describe this magnetic field. Since it changes all the time, an international committee publishes the International Geomagnetic Reference Field, which is updated every five years, but must extrapolate until the next five-year model because the Earth's, the Earth's field is continually changing. The upshot is that only in the last three years can your Android or iPhone measure the magnetic field with a magnetometer, compare it to the... Um, IGRF 2010, that's that massive model they have, find the down direction with the accelerometer and figure out which way it is pointed so that, for example, this constellation app can tell you the name of the star you were looking at. And the loggerhead somehow is born with a magnetometer and accelerometer in IGRF 2010 preloaded. Of course, by now it's IGRF 2015, but whatever. Amazing. Uh, the 2010 version of the International Geomagnetic Reference Field, which Rob Sheldon referred to above as IGRF 2010, is sophisticated software, a series of mathematical models of the Earth's main field and its annual rate of change. The turtle doesn't just have machinery to accurately measure the strength and direction of Earth's magnetic field. It somehow has software built into its brain so that it can adjust to changes. Another study concludes that Sakai Salmon uses the Earth's magnetic field to navigate thousands of miles back to the stream where they were born. And there are others. This keeps getting invented over and 
over and over again. I have a gut sense that the ability of the loggerhead turtle to navigate according to Earth's magnetic field must be, at some levels, an irreducibly complex system. It's hard to see how it could ever develop in a gradual, step-by-step, -step, purely Darwinian process, especially when it's not useful until you get all the way through. For example, simply knowing the strength of a magnetic field would appear to have no evolutionary advantage, yet that appears to be essential for loggerhead navigation. And how did the incredible software needed to navigate by Earth's magnetic field arise by chance? A discussion of amazing biological systems could go on and on. Did you know the Caribbean reef squid communicate by the colors, patterns, textures, and textures on their skin? I suspect that there are thousands, perhaps millions, of irreducibly complex systems in living creatures. Orphan genes. Soon after the scientists began to read the code in DNA, they discovered that many of the genes in each species had no family. They also discovered that many of these so-called orphan genes play a key role in making the species unique, such as creating toxin for jellyfish and preventing freezing in polar cod. Although, to be fair, the latter one could arise by a more typical Darwinian process. As might be expected, the original consensus was that the further analysis would solve the puzzle and the ancestors of each such orphan gene would be found. But that has not happened, at least for the most part. Orphan genes have since been found in every genome sequence to date, from mosquito to man, roundworm to rat, and their members are still growing. A 2009 paper found comparative genome analysis indicate that every taxonomic group so far studied contains 10 to 20 percent of genes that lack recognizable homologs, similar counterparts in other species. Brand new genes. Orphan genes can comprise one third or even more of a genome. The leafcutter ant has 9,000 361 proteins that are unique, represented over, representing over half of its predicted genome. Leafcutter ants are found in South and Central America and parts of the Southwest United States. They can build underground nests almost 100 feet in diameter, containing millions of individuals in just a few years. Other than human beings, they create the largest and most complex societies of all animals. Another study of seven ant species found 28,581 genes that were unique only to ants and not found in other insects. On average, each ant species contains 1,715 unique genes, orphan genes. So a question on that. Uh, yes. Uh. So are we going to then say that each of those ant species had to be on the ark? Um, and that they couldn't, so that a pair wouldn't have, they wouldn't have adapted then since? Interesting question. Of course, to be fair, ants don't take up a lot of room if you're uh, doing an art. But, but if you're going to extrapolate that concept to the rest. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, uh, next week, we're going to discuss that question, I think, at least for mammals, although I don't know that we can get to ants quite as easily. Yes, yeah, sorry. 715 different in each ant species? Or does he mean that ants in general have 1,715? Well, I suppose to answer that question, what we probably should do is go and go to the reference that's given. And you may have an answer for that. Because it, one ant surviving could answer the, if it's a second way. As long as it was a queen, we'd be OK. Uh, it does raise the question of whether, because usually insects and a few other things like that are thought of as surviving outside of an ark. Um, but uh, uh, maybe there was more collection. Maybe the I mean, 120 the, the idea years were needed. That each species, well, yeah, I'd have to reflect on this some more. So. Of course. He's not trying to answer that question because, at least in the book, he's on the, the side of people who allow uh, millions of years for all this to happen. And so uh, 
keeping something anywhere on Earth would work fine. Um, but it is an interesting question from a, uh, a short-age creationist point of view. Um, moving on to another question, uh, another point. All, according to neo-Darwinian theory, all genes should be descended from earlier models, and orphan genes with no recognizable ancestors shouldn't exist. But they do, and so far they have been found in all creatures. Clearly orphan genes are misnamed. Their ancestors are not dead or lost. Their ancestors never existed, except in the mind of God. They should be called designer genes. Human beings, what a piece of work is a man, says Prince Hamlet in Shakespeare's play. Molecular biologist confirms the obvious, Hamlet was right. Debate over the origin of human beings may be evolution's bloodiest battle. We'll talk a little more about that next week. I don't want to get into the history of politics of this fight. I want to go straight to the evidence of wonder. Again, let's suppose the existence of God as a scientific hypothesis and test that hypothesis using the tools of modern science. The Bible says God created human beings. Neo-Darwinian theory says human beings arose from a natural, undirected process. What scientific evidence is there that human beings were designed, and thus that the God of the Bible exists? Apes do look sort of like human beings. The fragmentary fossil record suggests that during the last eight million or so years there have been various species that could be considered transitional, including uh, Australopithecus, Afarensis, or Lucy, 3.2 million years ago, and Homo erectus, Turconoboy, 1.6 million years ago. But similarity in design does not prove the process was unguided. Mustang and Taurus cars have similar design, and you could argue that they developed from a common ancestor, Ford. But the similarities between these cars are the result of common design, not common descent by an unguided process. So. Similarities between the great apes and human beings could be evidence of unguided Darwinian descent or they could be evidence of a common designer. We need modern science to tell us which. Molecular biology does that to begin with and here there is no dispute from atheists or within the scientific community. Human beings are indeed a great piece of work. We have seen that the instructions to build us are contained in 3.2 billion subunits or letters of DNA, enough to fill about a thousand thick volumes with fine print. Our 25,000 or so genes take up about 1.5% of these letters, as we saw earlier. A gene contains the code to build a protein, a biological machine part, and our human body uses alternative splicing technology so that pieces of a gene can be spliced in various ways to create the code for different proteins. An average human gene contains 27,000 letters of DNA, which uses on average about 1,300 letters to build a protein with a mean length of 430 amino acids, and it requires, on average, uh, about 10 splices to put those 1,300 letters together. You may have read that only 1% of our DNA is different from that of a chimpanzee. That is not true. That figure looked only at genes and the machine parts and proteins they code for, and not at how the parts are put together and operated. Considering the following from an article in 2007 on the myth of 1%. And if any of you are going to the uh, North American Teachers Conference uh, in St. George, you'll get a much more thorough treatment of this particular subject from uh, um, Tim Standish. Using novel yardsticks and the flood of sequence data now available for several species, Researchers have uncovered a wide range of genomic features that may help to explain why we walk upright and have bigger brains, and why chimps remain resistant to AIDS and rarely miscarry. Researchers are finding that on top of the 1% distinction, chunks of missing DNA, extra genes, altered connections in gene networks, and the very structure of chromosomes confound any quantification of humanness versus chimpness. There isn't one single way to express the genetic dis distance between two complicated living organisms. Um, Gagno, a zoologist at UC San Diego, adds. 
Human beings have important features that chimpanzees and other great apes do not share. A key physical difference is our ability to walk upright. It is said that humans and chimpanzees shared a common ancestor perhaps six to nine million years ago. That's less than one million generations. One million generations is hugely inadequate for you know, Darwinian theory. According to, uh, I'm going to just jump, I usually don't do this, but I'm going to give you one of the notes because I think it's an important one. This is note J that was referred to in the last slide. According to scientists at Cornell, the time for a specific mutation that makes a new DNA binding site to first happen and then become fixed in a primate population has been estimated at six million years. That's one change. R. Durrett and D. Schmidt, they had no idea what they were doing, waiting for regulatory sequences to appear, annals of applied probability. Uh, if the new binding site requires two new bases, the time is estimated to be 216 million years. In other words, it ain't happening. That's just changing two. And that's a DNA binding site, not a protein. That might be changing a binding site on a protein, if you're lucky. You can do one amino acid in reasonable time. A DNA binding site is a piece of DNA that is eight letters long. You're going to change one letter. It takes the entire history of purported history of human ape changes. Human beings have 20 distinct families of genes that ch and chimpanzees and other mammals do not have. Let that sink in. 20 distinct families of genes that chimpanzees and other mammals do not have. Each family has multiple genes. Again, and forgive me if you're getting tired of me saying this, each of these genes codes for one or more proteins, molecular machine parts, that makes human beings distinct. Remember, we can change one base in six million years. You've got to come up with a whole protein and do it 20 times over. The key difference between us and the great apes is not physical. The key difference is between the species, and the defining difference is the much greater sophistication and capability of the human brain. In 2011, scientists identified 198 orphan genes in humans, chimpanzees, and orangutans. That's the whole group, of course. That code for proteins used in the brain. These are all young in an evolutionary sense, less than 25 million years old. And 54 of these are solely human. So it appears that human beings have at least 54 new brain genes. <coughs> new DNA coding to build sophisticated nanotechnology we use to think and reason. Remember that each gene codes for at least one protein, and most human genes code for more. Since the human brain is superior, I don't really hear any argument about that. Um, it appears that these 54 new brain genes, with coding for at least 54 extra protein machines, have a beneficial effect. And it all happened by random mutations. <coughs> it is surely an over oversimplification, but in some sense, our understanding today of how our brains work resembles the limited knowledge 150 years ago of how cells work. We thought then cells were homogeneous globules of plasm, a jelly-like goo that somehow made life possible. Remember, that's an Ernst Haeckel quote. The, today, the common perception is that our brains are just collections of neurons that somehow send electrical charges that allow us to think. But when do you think it is, when you think about it, when you do think about it just a little, the underlying programming and sophistication must be breathtaking. Consider memory, especially photographic or eidetic memory. When I was a young adult, I could stare at a page, turn away, and later read the text. Think about the requirements for that. 
Even apart from such feats, exactly how is it at a molecular level that you can remember passcodes, quote poetry, or know where you left your car keys? Okay, it doesn't always work perfectly. But the interesting thing of it is, when they stimulate brains of people, all of that memory is still there. Just the address had been lost on the hard drive. Is there enough hard drive space to make, to make that work? The human being is not a simple system. It is perhaps the most complex system in all life. Modern science is only beginning to understand how it works. So I won't bore you with the rest of how we don't know. Somehow within just a few million years, and perhaps as recent as within the last 100,000 to 200,000 years, a blink of an eye in the history of life on this planet, some or all of these 54 new molecular machines, were created. Still believe it's there by random chance? I just hit you with a lot, so take a breath and marvel. At least 16 anatomical changes to walk upright. 54 new genes with new brain technology. Less than 1 million generations to evolve by chance, where each replication has an error rate of only one DNA letter in a billion. Take another breath. These are facts of science. They have been actually, the mutation rate is worse than that, and we're probably going downhill, but that's another story. Take another breath. These are facts of science. They have been discovered by observation, experiment, and logic. They are not religious facts. They prove that Darwin's theory of natural selection acting on accidental mutations cannot possibly be a complete explanation of how human beings were created. Darwin's theory has no mathematical close. Number, not religious belief, proves it to be false. Some species, sure species are connected, but it's common design, not common descent, merely through chance based on guided processes. Imagine you're digging up skeletons of cars and you come across some you attribute to the species Ford from the first specimen you call Model T, actually Model A, I think, then it inexplicably appears in the fossil record around 1908 to a variety of later and more advanced specimens, including your favorite, a Ford Electric, a Focus Electric, that you carbon date back to 2013. To what do you attribute changes in the species? And to what would you attribute that 1970 AMC Gremlin fossil? Well, maybe design, but not necessarily intelligent design, certainly not enough. Um, Bats and dolphins, and I'm sorry, I should have put, uh, that's my ellipses, have hundreds of similar genes for echolocation, a form of sonar. Did they mate somehow? Uh, and again, that should be my ellipses. As we've seen, evolution is a complex and often confusing subject. Sometimes I want to put the science aside and enjoy the wonder. For that, I recommend a beautiful new video, Flight, the Genius of Birds. For those of you who are curious, I believe that uh, 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 Tim Standish makes a uh, cameo in that uh, particular video. So how did living creatures learn to fly? As the video explains, to literally get off the ground, birds have hollow bones, an improved cardiovascular system, improved muscles, feathers, wing design, and more. Consider, uh, compare an a eagle to the most advanced jet. The jet is a triumph of human achievement. Yet to me, the eagle is a much more advanced piece of engineering. The eagle has greater aerodynamic flexibility, can t obtain its own food, and can do other things that jets cannot do, not the least of which is produce baby eagles. And all of this eagle technology starts with a single cell. I began assuming neo-Darwinian theory must be true. I learned interesting question why he had to learn it outside of science classes. I learned that the facts of science contradicted and the emperor of Neo-Darwinian theory has no mathematical close. When the paradigm breaks and the wonder sparkles, an awful lot of college biology <coughs> professors are going to look pretty silly. To me, the puzzles of macroevolution are the fifth wonder of modern science, the fifth of seven in our count to God. My journey next took me back to physics for a closer look at planet Earth. You may have read our galaxy has billions of planets like Earth. Let's look under that headline. I think Earth is special. 
Uh, my take on all this, I like uh, Douglas Sell's argumentation. Again, that's part of why I spent so much time on it. He shows that if, even if one accepts the standard geological time scale, mechanistic evolution does not provide a mathematically defensible explanation for life, failing in last week's talk with the lack of transitional forms in the fossil record, the abrupt appearance of diverse kinds of organisms, and the lack of mathematically defensible theory, and this week with the demise of junk DNA, the presence of irreducible complexity, orphan genes, and human distinctiveness. And some of these things go together. Human distinctiveness is associated, among other things, with orphan genes. I think he effectively trashes neo-Darwinian theory. And he has merely scratched the surface. Once the protective layer of intimidation is removed from neo-Darwinism, it is really indefensible. I think that all of conservative Christians need to get used to thinking of neo-Darwinism as a paper, paper tiger. And I think finally it makes one wonder how many other paper tigers are out there. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Just a, a question here, a uh, technical question actually. How do you define an orphan gene? Uh, how different does the uh, DNA have to be? Seems to me while back, Doug Axe was talking about uh, families, these different families uh -huh. of, of uh, proteins. Uh, uh, I don't recall exactly what the what the definitions used for these different. Uh, what is an orphan gene? What is a family? Well, I suppose that uh, one of the uh, differences would be, for example, E. coli has uh, a. Uh, an enzyme that's required for biotin, and I'm trying to think what the other one is, a biotin synthesis. synthesis, synthesis. And um, uh, there's another, another gene that whose function I don't require, uh, recall specifically, but is an entirely different uh, 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 biochemical pathway. And that those genes have perhaps 75 or 80 uh, percent overlap in the uh, in the proteins that make them up, and therefore have a somewhat similar overlap in the DNA that makes them up. Um, and th those would usually be considered a uh, a, uh, a gene family. And apparently there are seven changes that it specifically, if you make those changes, you can change the function of one to the function of the other. Outside of that, there are other ones that kind of help a little bit and so that you don't have, you know, 100% or well, let's say seven, it would be say about 95% identity. It's more like, you know, 80 or 85. Uh, because there are other uh, uh, changes that happen further away from the active site. Um, but the idea is that those things really kind of form a family. You can kind of see how one could be derived from the other either as a design or perhaps even as a mutation. Although, if you start asking, well, how many mutations do you have? Uh, how fast could that happen in E. coli? It kind of falls apart, even something that close. Uh, there are a, a gene family, for example, the cytochrome C gene is in its own gene family, but there would be other other uh, proteins that might overlap by, you know, 70, 80 percent. Clearly not random. You know, random you'd expect 5 percent and perhaps if you allow for some adjustment, maybe 10, 15 percent. Maybe because uh, not all, 
not all amino acid residues are used equally. You might get up to 20%. But beyond that, just throwing two proteins together and hoping isn't going to give you an, uh, a, uh, uh, more than about 20% at the maximum. And so, you know, if they find things that are 35%, they actually get excited because these are way more than uh, uh, randomly similar. Um, and whenever you have groups of proteins that, you know, are that kind of similarity, they'll say, oh, we found a family. Again, going between members of the family may not be legitimate either. But certainly going outside of a family, you now have a whole new family. You're going to have to have a, a you're starting from scratch almost. Um, and so that's, that's what you're looking at with a protein family. Well, what they're saying is that there are these genes there. And they seem to be doing something. And yet, they don't fit into any of the standard families. In fact, in some cases, you can't even go back to the old uh, DNA of, let's say, the chimpanzee and find something that is decayed from or perhaps originated that protein but no longer functions as a protein. And uh, I mean, some of them some of them look like they could have come from you know non-coding stretches. Uh, although again, the question is which way did it go? Maybe chimpanzees have degenerated since they were created. Um, but some of them are just basically whole cloth, and that's when. Uh, uh, Doug Axe's estimate of 10 to the 77th fully applies. And, you know, 10 to the 77th is sort of like winning the lottery, oh, probably seven times in a row. And then you're trying to tell me that the same guy won it 14 times in a row because we have two proteins, and now we have 54 proteins, of which, let's say, one-third are, are, have no counterpart in the chimpanzee not even a non-coding one. Well, now you're looking at winning the lottery 50, 60 times in a row. At this point, I begin to think that somebody has a lottery winning uh, function. This is just not rational to think that this is random chance. Now, he was making a case for evolution taking longer than we thought. It seems like in the last few years I've seen some statements that it's occurring faster than we thought. Do you know what they're basing that on? Yeah, it depends on how you count it and what you're counting. Apparently finch beaks move pretty rapidly. They can happen during historical observations. Now creating the finch beak in the first place, that's a whole different question. So size variations happen extremely rapidly. The stuff that seems to happen fast is at that microevolution rather than macro. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually a good thing for creationists who are trying to explain how all the dogs came from one mm -hmm. pair. Is that epigenetic change? Well, some of it could be uh, epigenetic change. Some of it could be uh, uh, just simply uh, uh, mutations, uh, if you think about it, uh, we have uh, mutations in human beings that will create, for example, extra large people who, you know, perhaps are, you know, eight feet, nine feet high. Uh, it usually comes with some other disadvantages and therefore does not take over the population as one might think it ought to. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you live in a particular environment where being that big and that heavy um, gives you an advantage, uh, you can create a dodo bird out of a pigeon pretty rapidly. This, this is a question of mine is, you know, do, 
is there some construct or approach that we can even decide what are the limits of adaptation? Uh, uh, I'd like to hear a good discussion on do we have some ability to say, well, here's a boundary beyond which adaptation does not or either hasn't been observed or cannot on a theoretical basis or what. So that's, I don't do it. How, how would we approach or begin to discuss that? What are that, the limits that, of adaptation? That is a great question. Uh, it's a question that uh, I will warn you that if you try to answer that question in graduate school, you may not get through. Um, there is a book by um, uh, uh, Michael Behe called The Edge of Evolution, which asks exactly that question. How fast are the limits that one can expect from an evolutionary process? And uh, the answers do not come out favorable to Darwinian evolution. <coughs> And uh, Behe is lucky because he has tenure and nobody can kick him out of his job. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he probably would be now. If you go to his website, the, uh, the university uh, required him to have a page saying, this is Michael Behe's opinion, it does not represent the university. <coughs> We could add to this the fact that some speciation is pure de de degeneration. That's right. That's right. Some of no it design whatsoever. That's right. And in fact, some of the stuff that you could, you know, uh, gigantism would be interesting to study the, uh, the the reason for it. But I rather suspect that it has to do with uh, decreased feedback allowing for pituitary hormone to go to larger levels than the usual, at least one particular kind of gigantism. Uh, I think there are still dodo bird parts, and it would be very interesting to, to sequence those, which uh, could still be done, and ask the question, what were the changes that were required to produce dodo birds out of pigeons? I mean, they're clearly pigeons in terms of their general, or maybe they're rock doves, I'm not sure, but they're, there's some kind of bird of that general family uh, that has degenerated into living on an island where flight is not a particular advantage. In fact, flight is a disadvantage because if you fly, you might fly out into the ocean and get lost. Um, and um, uh, of course, it's a disadvantage when intelligent humans come by and find that you're big and plump and tasty, and, and you can't fly to get away from them. To me, the, the uh, challenging thing in a way is, is to, how has humanity uh, trapped itself into this game here? Uh, I mean, we've seen it go <laughs> before our eyes over the years. We know that humanity does change ideas, I mean, you know, and, uh, Antiquity, you know, reason was the important thing, and Dark Ages authoritarianism was the authority, important thing. Now, now we're in a materialistic mode, which kind of uh, encourages this type of thinking. But man, uh, this is so spread, so universal, and yet has so so many problems. Uh, yes. how, how did we get into this? It's really quite simple. Um, when start, one starts saying that one does not need any kind of authority, it's easy to say, and that includes the church. And then it's easy to go beyond that and say, and that includes the Bible. <coughs> and so you wind up with people who, in geology, want to, and I'm quoting, free the science from Moses. And then you apply it to biology, and you have people who are trying to free the science from Moses again. Yes, um, if we can pass the mic back. I'm going to have to work to get to give your opinion.
Yes. Apparently, within the last few days, Turkey has voted that they will not allow evolution to be taught until students go to the university. In some of the Middle Eastern countries, they start teaching it in grade five, but most of them apparently don't teach it until university. They don't want to confuse the students. They want to have what they believe about the origin of life based on the Koran, and so with the approval of Erdogan, the scientists in Turkey have said no evolution until they go to university. Uh, until they go to university, he'll, the, he'll allow it then? or They allow it in university, but they don't allow it elementary and high school age. Well, that's... It was, um, in, it was in the news this morning. Yeah. That's unfortunate for evolution because they need to catch them early because people instinctively believe in design and you've got to stop that earlier or it's just going to take over. I think that's good, but you can also make an argument that we need to help our students realize uh, how bad evolution is before they get to university level. Well, I think that maybe one of the things that can happen is that it can be framed in uh, in the way that Doug L. has finally kind of been forced to frame it, you'll notice that when we were talking last week, he, w he was discussing, you know, all the things that he had learned that he obviously didn't learn in high school when you would think he should have learned them. And maybe that's one of the things that we need to come back to is being more, uh, more careful to get our, you know, high school in and elementary school people to realize what is going on with the uh, uh, with the situation. Yes, Doug. Um, I mean, it seems to me as though neo Darwinism. You know, serious question as to whether it's powerful enough to explain changes. Um, is to what extent is this recognized and to what extent is there a, an attempt to find an alternate but naturalistic explore, explanation? Because it seems like it's sort of, the situation is calling for like, is there some sort of system that could, it's almost like performing the role of intelligent design, but it's ba somehow based in the genes. Well, the, that's like, the thing about Darwinism is that it started out as a designer substitute. And there really aren't any other designer substitutes. Uh, neutral evolution of any variety is just, you know, you randomly walk along and maybe you'll hit something, maybe you don't. Well, things in, uh, in biologi and biological <coughs> nature, if you want to call it that, look too good for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the eye looks like a craft, finely crafted piece of machinery. Uh, in fact, it looks more finely crafted than our machinery because it's got more detail and, um, and still looks good. Um, and if, if you read uh, uh, Richard Dawkins' description of uh, The Blind Watchmaker, he starts out with an exposition of the bat's ear and sonar, which is just overwhelming in the way it looks designed. Now he'll go on to say, but I don't think it is, and here's how it could have arisen without a designer. But the impression that you get is that it sure looks designed. And, and people who are being honest, and I think in this particular area, Dawkins is being honest, he says, it looks designed. And what I've got to persuade you is that it really isn't because we have a substitute mechanism. Well, if you don't have a substitute mechanism or the substitute mechanism that you propose is um, horribly and perhaps fatally flawed, then um, to reverse Dawkins' words, um, atheists will have to go back to being intellectually unfulfilled. That, of course, is not a uh, pleasant thought for an atheist. And you can see why 
uh, the field is full of as much vitriol as it is because you're attacking their religion. Of course, there is the alternative of the multiverse uh, to get away from God, go to the multiverse. Uh, but uh, this is, the, you have left science when you move to the multiverse. Um, well, yeah, certainly the kind of science that, that uh, makes predictions and, and uh, is able to live with them. You, you've, lo you've left that kind of science behind completely. Uh, in fact, almost perforce. And that's a, that's a problem. Uh, you know, what I think is funny is to watch Doug L. timidly approaching this do I have to do it kind of thing. Well, you know, if you're going to be intellectually honest, you have to look at it. And then starting <coughs> to look at it and realizing, you know what, they've sold me a bill of goods. Reality is nothing like what I was told when I was a kid in high school. And he's... Definitely unhappy about that. Almost angry. Uh, yeah. I heard about a high school not too terribly far from here that had 39 graduates, and every one of them was a valedictorian <laughs> because they didn't want to offend any of them. So uh, high school is... Uh, Degenerating at a tremendous rate here. Well, yes, there there are those problems. Uh, yes, uh, just a minute. We'll pass the mic to you. Go ahead. Uh, we all know that evolution is just a theory. It's a period. It's another science. But what uh, makes me crazy, you know, when I'm hearing that some scientists are saying that evolution is the science. Why is that so? Well, uh, because it makes scientific claims and because uh, it uses some people's conception of science which is that anything that requires a designer is ruled out to begin with. Um, there are some people who think that science can't deal with uh, uh, anything that has to do with uh, God or the miraculous, and therefore, uh, uh, Evolution is therefore science, even if it's wrong, because at least it's using the right methodology. Um, uh, it seems to me that uh, if science doesn't claim to know everything and can allow itself to be fit into something rather than uh, rather than saying that everything must have scientific methodology, the science fits quite comfortably into a uh, religious out outlook, a uh, theological outlook. I think that theology can legitimately reclaim its uh, place as the queen of the sciences. Um, but I also know that there are, are many people who uh, vigorously disagree with that. Uh, and many of which will say that, that if it can't be known by science, it doesn't exist even. Which uh, raises interesting questions about things like love and, uh, and beauty, which are difficult to study scientifically, but which do seem to be real. Raises the joke that the scientists climbed the mountain and only discovered the philosophers and theologians are already there. Yeah, that's the famous quote from Robert Jastrow, which uh, has 
the scientist climbing the mountain, and then at the end, he discovers the, sci the theologians have been sitting there for centuries. Yeah. And uh, for those who see science as the only way to beget truth, <laughs> that's a very discouraging uh, metaphor. Exactly. And it's not but, true, exactly as you said. Yeah. Uh, theologians have uh, deprecated their discipline to a certain extent by bowing down to science. Uh, they, uh, you know, they let Aristotle take over uh, in the Dark Ages, and then they uh, bowed to Newton and had to give that up uh, when quantum mechanics came in and uh, uh, some of them are still a hundred years behind quantum mechanics by the way <laughs> the, the science gains a lot of respect and I, I love science because it you know it's it deals with the simple it deals with the materialistic it, it, it gives you you can get some good very good answers out of it, it's, it's consistent and so on and so forth, but man, it uh, leaves a whole universe of uh, free will and and as you mentioned, emotions and so on out of the picture because they can't deal with those. Well, uh, I, I would say one other thing and that is that I just uh, looked at a video, I think it was uh, yesterday or day before, um, by Jonathan Bartlett, who ha whose entitled was Using Theology to Design Computer Programs. You'll have to read it to, to understand, or listen to it to understand, because, uh, you know, when you first hear it, you think, what? And then as he explains why, it actually makes sense. Um, uh, I will tell you in advance, it's not um, uh, Baptist or Adventist theology. It's more of a general, you know, what kind of people are, uh, what kind of, uh, maybe, uh, what is the nature of man is a good, a good way of putting it and what is the nature of nature, and uh, can mechanical objects imitate humans? And his answer is no, and so he, sa he says also, humans can imitate mechanical objects, but in many cases much slower because there's too much else going on with what we have to do. And so he suggests that writing computer programs should divide up the tasks between tasks that humans are better than computers at and tasks that computers are better than humans at and give the computers the, the computer-oriented task, if you want to call it that, give the humans the human-oriented tasks and, and rather than trying to uh, make everything into a computer uh, generated thing allow for each part to uh, play to its strengths, and um, it actually make a, made a, quite a bit of sense. Um, but that's a, that's a, an interesting way of looking at it. Um, he coined the phrase "artificial artificial intelligence," and that is, at a certain point, you put people because they're better at certain tasks. And at least right now, they clearly are. And the question is, well, could you uh, design an, an artificial intelligence? Frankly, the answer is probably not, and you can probably mathematically prove that. Um, but what that does is it, it suggests that there are certain things that science is very good at, and some things that science perhaps is less good at, but that humans should be tasked to do um, because we're better at those things. Um, 
I, I know there are some here who've debated that position in the past. I'd like to offer them the opportunity to uh, respond if they wish. Uh, if perhaps uh, no takers, then, then uh, what I will do is say, come back next week and we'll discuss again uh, the human Y chromosome. If you want to have a preview of what I'm looking at, uh, what I'm thinking about, uh, I Google game the human Y chromosome and you can watch the last round and uh, get prepared for this one. So, see you next week.